So I am going to talk about uh, my work in uh, the Community Sustainability Department at Michigan State. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about a, a course that uh, I've been developing with a colleague, uh, Pat Norris. Pat is uh, training is in economics, my training is in philosophy, um, and uh, this. so basically this department uh, uh, offers uh, three majors, and uh, one of them is uh, environmental studies and sustainability, one is sustainable parks, recreation, and tourism, and the third is agriculture, food, and natural resources education. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the students in this program are uh, quite varied. Uh, some of them are, um, you know, very quantitative, but a significant number of them are partly in this major because they don't like math. Uh, that will become a little bit significant in terms of what I'm talking about. Uh, the, the department is organized with three core courses that serve all of these majors, and then after that you're sort of off. Uh, doing things that uh, are more uh, related to the particular major that you're in. Uh, one of them is a 200 level course called Introduction to Sustainability, uh, a, a 300 level course called Theoretical Foundations of Sustainability, uh, and then a course called Community Engagement for Sustainability, uh, which is uh, very involved with uh, working with uh, uh, community partners in um, various kinds of engagement. What I'm going to be focusing on uh, is this course, uh, which we have uh, uh, taught just this past year two times, uh, and uh, we typically teach it to about 35 students um, uh, every semester. Um, the, um, I don't know why that's underlined, it's not supposed to be yet, but at any rate, these are the uh, departmental, what are considered to be our educational competencies. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, particular course that uh, uh, we teach uh, really focuses on uh, some of, uh, on a subset of these. I don't think they're all going to come up for some reason. Uh, but at any rate, uh, in addition to, there they go, uh, in addition to uh, uh, e uh, a bit of ecological literacy, a bit of economic literacy, critical thinking, ethics, uh, systems thinking, also, uh, uh, we touch on these things, although these are not really the key uh, focus of the course. One of the things that uh, we are, I'm really, in contrast to some of the other people, I'm actually going to talk quite a bit about content uh, today as opposed to uh, methods. Uh, but uh, uh, we have designed this course with the idea that uh, we want our graduates to um, understand and appreciate uh, both the contributions and the limitations of disciplinary knowledge. Um, um, you know, it's our, our presumption that the disciplines aren't going away uh, anytime soon. Uh, maybe we're wrong about that. I don't think either of us would be too upset if that happened. Uh, but um, uh, we're really uh, trying to develop a course that would uh, help our students uh, uh, um, both understand uh, you know, how you tend to think within a discipline, uh, understand some of the main concepts that come out of, uh, especially ecology and economics, um, we do. Uh, it, it Actually, it's in our 200 le uh, level course, uh, you know, cover some things like uh, uh, life cycle analysis and, and business school supply chain management, some of those kinds of uh, concepts. Um, what I'm really going to focus on today is systems thinking, uh, and frankly, this is something that we uh, have come to believe that a lot of our students, uh, uh, some of we, we had a great presentation, uh, uh, Jan gave a great presentation on community gardens. We actually have a very significant um, ag uh, uh, organic farming component in our department. Uh, one of the things that I think that we've experienced is that we get students, and we've actually used some of these game methods too, is that uh, we get those students and they can't actually relate the systems ideas that they're experiencing in some of that with the way that uh, systems concepts are used in uh, disciplines like economics uh, and ecology. So in some respects, what we're really trying to get across is kind of an observer perspective on systems, uh, and uh, that it has become one of the main objectives. Uh, the only book that we use for this course is uh, Danella Meadows' book, on systems. I'm sure many of you uh, have some familiarity with this. Uh, it's a non-quantitative approach to systems. 
Um, it, 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 it is a, a bit more rigorous than uh, some approaches to systems in the sense that uh, it doesn't really just sort of leave it at the level of connections. Uh, there are, in order to develop a, a logically coherent system in Meadows uh, framework, you do have to uh, pay attention to stocks and flows and make sure that uh, if something is contributed to a stock, it's actually the kind of flow that really could contribute to that stock. Uh, in other words, uh, information doesn't make the amount of food more. It might make the amount of information grow, but it wouldn't make the amount of food grow. So uh, there's a certain sort. There is a certain um, uh, logic that underpins this. This is a couple of the systems diagrams that uh, Meadows uses. Uh, they're quite intuitive. Uh, the idea of uh, faucets controlling flows, and then the little boxes represent. Uh, key stocks, you probably can't read that, but uh, uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a model um, of uh, the relationship between uh, economic growth, so capital is in the box at the top, and uh, some um, non-renewable resource, probably oil, uh, which is down in the box on the bottom. Uh, there are also models that uh, are uh, classic uh, ecological type models, uh, classic uh, predator prey uh, type models. This is actually not the full uh, uh, picture uh, of that, but so in the context of uh, teaching some of the uh, uh, ecological concepts, we would go through some of that. Uh, one of the main things that we want to try to get across in this course uh, is that sustainability is about more than just the environment. This is the bias uh, that our students have. Uh, they uh, come in with the idea that uh, uh, you know they're they're very motivated uh, on environmental issues, uh, and uh, they kind of get the idea about environmental sustainability, uh, but they don't necessarily apply the idea in other areas. Uh, so, um, um, looking at, at this uh, general uh, focus, uh, we try to. Uh, introduce this idea of competing paradigms, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, it represents probably, in terms of the amount of class time that we spend on it, maybe 10% of the overall course. Uh, a lot of time spent just developing uh, these other competencies, but this is kind of the place where we really emphasize uh, the critical thinking, the ethics, and uh, the boundary crossing uh, elements of the course. So, um, uh, you know, kind of bear with me a bit on some of the background, uh, but uh, we do introduce this idea of paradigms, um, which uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, from the work of Thomas Kuhn. Uh, we really try to get our students to think of a paradigm as a distinct set of concepts or thought patterns. It would include theories, it would include different research methods, it would include postulates or standards for what constitutes a legitimate contribution to a field. And uh, we would suggest to our students that uh, when you get into a disciplinary concept, you typically see people working in uh, at least one paradigm, and in some disciplines you have uh, competing paradigms. Or, uh, and when you have competing paradigms, this is one of the things that really uh, contributes to uh, disagreement uh, within the discipline. Uh, the classic example from Kuhn's work uh, was, of course, uh, Paradigms in Astronomy. And uh, his uh, uh, first book on paradigms uh, contrasted the Copernican paradigm with the Ptolemaic paradigm. Uh, the Copernican paradigm, of course, has the sun in the middle, and uh, the Ptolemaic paradigm has the earth in the middle with the sun going around and the planets uh, making these uh, strange little epicycles, uh, which were amazingly predictably accurate. Uh, but uh, um, um, which uh, uh, ultimately were abandoned in astronomy. Uh, one of the ideas that we try to get across is that uh, paradigms not only influence how work is done in the science, but they actually influence how people see and interpret phenomena, how they see and interpret the world. And uh, uh, in the case of the, as, uh, Kuhn's work, uh, in, uh, in the Ptolemaic paradigm, which uh, was dominated uh, for centuries, uh, you look out and you see the sun going down, uh, which is that you're sitting at a fixed point and the sun is moving around me, and the shift to the Copernican paradigm, uh, it's no longer the sun going down, the horizon is moving up. My location is actually rotating in relation to the fixed point of the sun. 
Um, so uh, the, the general idea that we're trying to get across here is that uh, paradigms actually run pretty deep and they influence the way uh, people actually see the world. Uh, in terms of ethics, they uh, also point to um, notions of importance, um, what's really at the center or what's crucial. Uh, and so uh, in terms of some of the ethics that we would discuss in the course, um, you know, for some people, uh, human beings are what's most important. Uh, for some people, for another view would be that uh, life processes would be what is most important, what's central. Uh, and uh, an ecocentric view actually focuses on um, the systematic or, uh, organization of things like systems, excuse me, not systems, but species, uh, which are, of course, not themselves <coughs> living entities, but are uh, the evolving systems that allow uh, uh, evolution to occur. So uh, with this sort of background on, on paradigms, uh, we suggest that uh, uh, there are really two, um, and perhaps more, but uh, we're going to fo we focus on two paradigms that are operative uh, within sustainability studies today. Uh, these are not, we make great pains that students uh, understand that these are not intended as definitions of sustainability. They're intended uh, as concise statements that would sort of open the door into very broad paradigmatic ways of understanding sustainability. So the paradigmatic approach would include things like the broader theories and uh, uh, concepts, but uh, the, 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 these are intended as, as, as short statements that are suggestive of these paradigms. Uh, on the resource sufficiency paradigm, a process or practice is sustainable to the extent that resources needed to carry it out are foreseeably available. Uh, and on the functional integrity paradigm, a system is sustainable to the extent that it is resistant to threats and resilient or adaptive in response to disruption. Uh, and uh, so there's obviously a, a contrast in the first place in terms of what's central, right? What's important uh, in the resource sufficiency uh, paradigm. Uh, we're focused, starting out with a focus on processes or practices, whereas the functional integrity uh, program, uh, approach really starts out with a system, right? Systems are important in functional integrity, however, uh, because uh, um, you know many of the processes that and practices that are of interest uh, can be analyzed as systems and are analyzed as systems uh, within the various disciplines. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, many of the um, uh, of the uh, much of the availability of the various goods that are of interest, if you're taking a resource sufficiency approach, uh, are determined by. Uh, systemic practices. So if you're working in agriculture, uh, you know, soil fertility, you're not going to understand soil fertility until, except as a kind of systematic process. You're not going to understand a hydrological cycle uh, as a, except as a systematic process. Yet we argue, and I live very substantially in a college of agriculture, that probably 80 or 90 percent of the people working in agriculture uh, are not taking an overall systems perspective. Uh, they're interested in processes or practices like farming, and they're interested in whether or not they're going to be able to continue to produce food. And they only think about systems in terms of their contribution uh, to actually uh, carrying on those processes and practices. Uh, our primary method for teaching this contrast is to draw uh, two big contrasts. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what these uh, two contrast cases are. Uh, um, uh, part of the idea of emphasizing mortgages um, here is to drive home this idea uh, that sustainability is about more than the environment. It's also, although I don't think our students pick up on this, uh, to show that economists are capable of thinking in systems terms. Um, so um, this is a model um, that uh, I'm not going to talk through, but. Uh, uh, hopefully those of you that are at least have some familiarity with uh, uh, the kind of pictures that uh, uh, Meadows draws, it's, it's the model of Malthus's um, uh, uh, relationship between food and population. And uh, in Malthus's study, there were essentially a couple of, of uh, responses to uh, the race between uh, <coughs> population growth and food production, one of which is that you can actually increase the death rate, right? And in Malthus's uh, discussion, you do that by uh, fighting lots of wars uh, and people.
people die, right? Uh, you can decrease the rate of population growth. Uh, in Malthus's study, uh, he uh, wouldn't use uh, such an indelicate word as, popul as prostitution. Uh, he talked about, about vice, right? But vice is one of the responses to uh, the population growth. So we actually uh, decrease the rate of population by uh, 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 talking about that. And uh, contemporary <laughs> substitute things like economic development uh, or women's literary, literacy is one of the key ways to actually uh, affect uh, that. Uh, and uh, a third is to actually increase the rate of resource extraction. Uh, my colleague, colleagues in uh, the plant sciences department um, like to point this one out as the big one, and they would argue that we've actually been very successful in doing that since Malthus wrote. Uh, and then finally, uh, you can decrease the rate of consumption. Uh, what we like to point out is that all of these uh, uh, solutions focus on rates, uh, they actually focus on systems of differential equations that when you really get right down to it. Uh, and that, uh, uh, so the responses really focus on um, um, key flows, the rate at which key flows are affected, uh, but they don't actually alter the basic structure of the system. Uh, and uh, this leads to a way of thinking about uh, sustainability in the context of the population food production uh, race that Malthus described, uh, where everything is largely about the efficiency uh, of food production and consumption and uh, limiting waste uh, and also the distribution uh, of uh, food uh, uh, comes up in that case, right? We um, would go on and show that we can make some substitutions in the key stocks and flows, but not the overall system structure. Uh, and then we actually get a very general picture of uh, sustainability. Uh, if we just talk about all natural resources and their relationship to uh, any and all consumer goods, and then talk about human welfare instead of population growth, we actually have the same system design. Uh, we would have to kind of redefine some of the key drivers, uh, and we're not going to do that. Uh, and then we actually wind up with the approach to sustainability uh, that was outlined uh, in the Brundtland Report and what gave us the most uh, famous uh, and I think still most frequently cited uh, definition of a sustainable process, in this case development. We, all, we have to stand on our heads to get students to recognize that sustainable development is not necessarily the same thing as sustainability, but nonetheless, uh, it, it still is a very general model. Uh, and again, uh, with this model, it's still uh, key rates uh, that matter, uh, and uh, development becomes unsustainable, generally if the resources needed to drive it are not foreseeably available. So this gives us uh, what we're calling the resource sufficiency approach to sustainability. Um, I'm going to try to, I'm going to have to go way too fast here, but in the, when we get around to talking about mortgages, we start out just with a simple systems model, of the relationship between writing mortgages. How many people in here have a mortgage? Right? This is actually one of our problems, is that none of our students actually have a mortgage. <laughs> and actually, our students are too young. How many people of here remember that there was a real estate crisis in 2007? <laughs> right? Our students don't remember that. <laughs> um, so those are some of the problems we have in this example. But uh, you know, there's a key decision point in the bank about whether or not you're going to write the loan, uh, and this uh, is going to be determined by whether or not you think uh, you're giving the loan to somebody that's going to pay it back, right? And there are some feedbacks that uh, or that uh, uh, go into that, right? We ask our students, is this a sustainable, a stable, or sustainable system? And they're supposed to say yes, right? Um, and we'll spend some time talking about that. With them. Uh, and then we want to uh, suggest that uh, there's actually another subset system here uh, that uh, uh, is the uh, uh, way that home asset value is affected. Uh, and we suggest that uh, over the last um, uh, 30 years prior to 2007, uh, this uh, feedback loop between home asset value and inflation uh, was dominant within this system. And it created a situation in which a loan officer basically could never lose money by writing a mortgage. Uh, and uh, then we go on, and more complexity, uh, uh, suggest that uh, another thing that happened is we saw a relationship between this, uh, these community banks and uh, investment banks on Wall Street, uh, 
uh, where they started bundling these mortgages and treating them as an investment. Uh, and this uh, channeled more, even more money back into uh, the local banks. Uh, and uh, it created a, a situation where even more of these loans started to get written. Uh, and uh, some regulatory uh, blurring took place. Uh, and uh, the result was that we now had a system uh, where there's even less diligence in writing these residential loans. Uh, and uh, a situation where the depositor's assets are actually now placed at risk, right? And we ask, is this a, sta a sustainable system? And here the answer is supposed to be no, right? We would have a class discussion to try, try to talk through that. Uh, and uh, uh, come back over here uh, in 2007, some previously under <coughs> poorly understood driver messes up these money, messes up this feedback. Uh, people who bought their homes on speculation stop paying their mortgages. Uh, but since those loans are now part of the investment banking system, uh, it doesn't just mean that the local banks go broke, it affects the whole economy. Right? Uh, and uh, uh, so now we ask, is this a sustainable system? And if they've seen the Wolf of Wall Street, they say no. So we get a concept of a collapse. But we want to point out that it's not like we ran out of any resource, right, in terms of making this an unsustainable system, right? So whereas over here in the Malthusian trap, the sustainability of population growth is limited by agriculture, right, a natural resource, in this case a renewable one, and in the Brundtland report it's limited by uh, the availability of capital. We spend a little bit of time going through some of the uh, strong versus weak capital debates in our class. Over here, it's not like we ran out of houses, buyers, or even monies. It was a structural failure in the feedback that control flows within the system. So closing a bit on how do we actually talk about this in connection with ethics. Uh, in the Malthusian trap, we're actually dealing with well-understood concepts from distributive justice. Uh, uh, succinctly, uh, you know, we're, we're producing stuff, but do we have enough uh, of what? And for whom? Uh, so the key questions are: Are these, uh, are these, is development uh, fairly distributed? Um, over here, the ethics really acquires associating value with the continuous functioning, resilience, or adaptation of the system. Right. So the system itself uh, and its operation uh, needs to be seen as having a certain kind of value, and this may not be easy to see. Uh, and, and and importantly, from an ethics perspective. Uh, it's not necessarily the perspective we want to take. Uh, from an ethics perspective, one of the weaknesses of resilience thinking is that when you value a, uh, the continuous operation of a system, uh, you may actually be quite insensitive to some of the issues of distributed justice. Uh, you know, we would argue that uh, uh, structural racism is a very resilient system. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, it's important, actually, from an ethics perspective, to put these uh, perspectives into dialogue with one another. So this is my uh, closing slide. Uh, we're trying to give our students some take-home messages. Different paradigms help us understand by technical experts. Sometimes have difficulty engaging each other uh, around the idea of sustainability. They show why we are now saying that some we should abandon sustainability and focus on resilience. Uh, you know, I'm interpreting. I think both of us are agreeing that some of this. A surge of uh, resilience thinking is people who've had this kind of perspective all along and have just sort of given up on the idea that people are ever going to understand sustainability. So now we're going to talk about resilience, right? Uh, I would say, you know, we're going to go through all of the same debates again, right? Um, and, and you actually see many of the same debates that mm -hmm. occurred with respect to sustainability even 20 years ago now being uh, recreated over the, over the definition of resilience. Both paradigms contribute to our understanding of sustainability. Uh, we don't, uh, un, one bad thing about using the, the uh, astronomy examples is the Ptolemaic view is now viewed as wrong. Right? We're not saying uh, one of these perspectives is wrong. Um, and uh, uh, again, ethics, I think, underlines that. Uh, and then we try to give the idea that, that being able to think across these paradigms uh, is a form of boundary crossing. Uh, I should say, however, that uh, the mortgage thing probably is just too complicated and it doesn't resonate with our students. They got maybe much more sense about this when we talked about Aldo Leopold and uh, uh, killing wolves in uh, Arizona. 
Uh, and uh, probably part of the problem is our students still think sustainability is all about the environment. Thank you. Probably one quick question. Please. Uh, I'm just curious how students have translated this into more practical decision making. So going from these sort of abstract concepts <laughs> into how they operationalize that. And for two reasons. One, because I found with our Tiger Society class, students are very challenged trying to see two right. views of the dialogue. Yeah. And because we just did a study of environmental studies syllabi across North America and found really broad patterns of teaching one particular view at the exclusion of others and giving students no tools for putting them in, in discourse. So one of the things that we, one of the course exercises that we use with this is uh, an online discussion forum. And this is the only answer I have to your question. And uh, uh, we give them a couple of prompts to talk about. And some of them really, uh, some of our prompts really uh, ask the students to reflect on other courses that they're, <coughs> that they're taking at MSU and where sustainability comes up and asking them, uh, do you see these paradigms as reflecting um, the way that the instructor seems to understand sustainability and approach it? And in fact, they do. So uh, after they've gone through this, um, uh, at least I'd say half to two thirds of our students are actually able to reflect on other courses uh, and see these as uh, uh, relating to uh, the way that sustainability is being approached from a disciplinary perspective. We really are trying to get our students beyond that and the next course, the 301 course, and one of the things that we're going to say is that you know, you're going to get out into the world where people are not part of an academic discipline and it's going to be much messier than this. Um, but, uh, uh, and in that course, uh, I think we're actually just now uh, starting to see some experience from students who've had this course and they go on and, and do some of the community engagement. Uh, and uh, um, we're monitoring that, but uh, at this point, it's just too soon to see what kind of effect our course has on that. So, thank you. Thank All you. Right, thank you.